Okay, I am uh, Scott Beckwith. I'm SAMPI's Global Technical Director and also the uh, Technical Editor for the SAMPI Journal. And uh, SAMPI would love to uh, welcome you all uh, in attendance today. Uh, the first thing I think we'd like to do before I introduce any speakers or discuss the project, uh, we'd like to have a poll. And if uh, Brianna Condon, who's uh, monitoring this from SAMPI, can pop up the call, we'd kind of like to get an idea of uh, what your background is, what's your experience. For example, the first question, do you have experience in wind or tidal blade design, manufacturing or testing? And if you could check that one off, that would give us an idea of what's going on. Oh, it looks like uh, almost a 50-50 split here. Uh, there's people on here that have experience with uh, uh, wind and tidal blade design, manufacturing and testing. So uh, you might, uh, might find that you're gonna find uh, some very new materials and some very new technology and test methods. So I don't think we've got another, I don't know if there's another poll question or not. If uh, there is, Brianna, can you show that? We're all set, Scott, with the one, thanks. Okay. So with that, uh, today's, uh, today's session is going to be very interesting. We're going to uh, get involved and talk about uh, some hybrid glass uh, powder, epoxy wind blades and uh, carbon. Uh, and uh, this is out of the University of Edinburgh. And uh, you've got a variety of speakers. You've got a, a team of speakers that are gonna cover this today. And what you'll find is there's gonna be some similarities between uh, what they're doing with uh, the wind blade, the novel wind blade they've got, as well as uh, uh, some uh, fast blade, which are uh, uh, underwater and uh, hydro hydro turbines. So to start with, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, uh, Jeffrey uh, Steiner. Uh, Dr. Steiner is uh, is the uh, senior experimental officer and project manager for fast blade. Now, fast blade is the the underwater uh, project but he's also been working on uh, this project as well. Uh, they have a partnership with Babcock uh, International Global and uh, his background actually is in minimizing uh, carbon and energy intensities in the oyster wave uh, energy converter. In other words, trying to minimize uh, energy loss uh, from what's measured and what is transferred. He's also been a team leader uh, for British Standards Institute and International. That's very important when you're trying to come up with test methods and make sure that uh, new test methods get entered into the system. He's also worked with Flowwave uh, at the University of uh, Edinburgh as well, where he is, he is there. So uh, Dr. Jeff Steiner will be uh, one, of the, uh, one of the speakers. Uh, another speaker will be uh, 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 an upcoming uh, a PhD student. Uh, he's working on his PhD right now, and that is Christoph Floriani. And he's got an ME, a mechanical engineering uh, degree, uh, master's of engineering from the University of Edinburgh as well. And his work has been on the fracture mechanics of composite materials for both wind and metal turbine blades. And he will talk about the characterization of carbon and glass fiber reinforced powder epoxy systems composites, a, a new system, a system that has a considerable fracture toughness over twice that of uh, standard epoxy resin. And with that, I want to turn this over to uh, Dr. Eddie McCarthy, and he will give you an idea of what the project is all about and uh, is, is a lead in uh, this particular area. With that, I turn it over to Eddie. Many thanks, uh, Scott, for the kind introduction. And I would like to thank you, Brianna, and all at the SAMPI team for this opportunity to speak to you all today. So this talk today is about the European Union Horizon 2020 project, Powder Blade, that took place between 27 and 2019. And this was a consortium that featured the Air Composites uh, CHO in Ireland, who are the manufacturing partner, um, Suslan Energy in the Netherlands, who were the, uh, the end user, uh, Westbeck, who conducted the economic case evaluation for the project, and ourselves at the School of Engineering, 
uh, who were the materials and structural evaluation partner. So the main object objectives of this uh, project were to measure the cost savings and uh, the risk reductions that could be introduced by using novel powder epoxy materials and processing. And secondly, by using intelligent use of hybrid carbon glass transitions in the design of, of, a, of a blade. And we were targeting the uh, offshore blade market and uh, we were targeting in particular blades of the length 60 to 100 meters. So the powder epoxy processing in particular can drive many process cost savings and risk reductions and also improvements in the quality and, and blade performance. And my colleague Christoph will describe that shortly. Um, secondly, the strategic use of carbon fiber can better manage stress transfer over rapid section changes on blades and help to reduce the weight of the blade overall, which has obvious advantages in both in terms of performance and logistic cost. So the focus of today's talk by Christoph and Jeff is mostly on the testing phase of the project, particularly on the methodology of the test and, and some of the outline test results. Um, and I should also mention that much of the testing work was a dress rehearsal, so to speak, um, for our much larger fast blade fatigue test facility um, that will be uh, commissioned in autumn 2021. So with that, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Christoph, who will go into the, the main technical body of the talk. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eddie, for this uh, introduction. Uh, so I will start by um, giving everybody uh, an introduction as to why we are using powder epoxy resin for this project. It's got a lot of very interesting features. Uh, the first one of which is uh, that it's got a separate melting and curing phases. And this can be very useful for, for the manufacturing of complex composite structures, such as wind and tidal turbine blades. They are typically manufactured in separate parts because of their shape, mean, meaning that they cannot be made in one shot. And then they have to be bonded together and cured again by using adhesives. So this requires several extra steps. With this resin, we can uh, make the different blade halves and just melt them into shape. But then instead of actually curing them, we can uh, place them together and do the final curing part in one phase. So that actually saves adhesives and uh, processing time. The powder epoxy resin can also be stored at room temperature for several years without degrading, uh, as opposed to plenty of other materials which uh, degrade far more quickly. Uh, it also has a very low minimal viscosity during curing, uh, enabling us to manufacture uh, complicated parts with uh, 3D curvature uh, with a low resin, uh, sorry, void contents. It also has a low exothermic reaction, which allows us to produce thick composite structures more rapidly and whilst avoiding uh, excess temperature buildup in the center of the composite structure. It's also suitable for out of autoclave manufacturing, which is really a must in the renewable energy industry as we cannot afford autoclaves for such large composite structures. Uh, it also produces no VOCs and no material waste, which is good when the environmental concern is taken into account. It has a very high toughness and therefore limits the risk of delamination. Um, and so because of all these reasons, it's tailored for large composite structures such as tidal turbine and wind turbine blades. The uh, torsion box demonstrator uh, was designed by Suzlon and manufactured by Air Composites, as we were mentioning earlier. Uh, the final part, manufactured part, you can see on the bottom right. And on the bottom left are the molds that were used for the manufacturing of the demonstrator. So the shape of this demonstrator is, um, it starts with a circular root and it transitions and tapers into a D-shaped cross section that you can see on the bottom right. Uh, it starts off as a pure glass carbon, uh, sorry, glass fiber composite near the roots and transitions into a full carbon fiber composite in the tip. There is a transition region between 2.5 and 3.5 meters from the roots. And from in, in this transition region, there is a gradual change from a pure glass to a pure carbon composite through the use of ply drops. The main objective of our test program were to ensure or determine if the blade fails under the four most critical design loads that were given to us by Suzlon 
in the design phase and to test uh, this uh, blade under the DNVGL uh, 03676 uh, test standard, which is a test standard um, typically used by uh, wind manufacturers for the testing of wind turbine blades. We wanted to ensure that no damage detrimental to the blade structure occurred during the testing phase. And we also wanted to measure strain so that we could feed it back to uh, Suzlon, um, measure the deflection to ensure that it did not exceed the maximum 0.4 meters that were allowed by Suzlon in the design phase. Uh, we want to measure the natural frequency. And finally, and most importantly, we wanted to ensure that no damage occurred specifically in the glass to carbon transition region, which was the crucial area in this test demonstrator. Uh, I will give you an outline of the test. So as I mentioned earlier, Suzlon had identified four critical loads during the design phase. Uh, obviously, we're not able to test hundreds of load cases. So they gave us the four load cases that you can see on the right. So as you can see, not only is the magnitude of the loads different between the four load cases, but also the orientation with regards to the blade. Um, the way we ran our test is we ran um, load case four to one, which is in order of increasing load. And we repeated load case four at the end of the test program to ensure that the blade still behaved the same as it did at the beginning of the test. We applied the load through the use of a hydraulic actuator at 5.5 meters from the roots. Uh, before and after each test, we measure natural frequency and blade damping through the use of accelerometers and by doing a free vibration test of the blade. We measured strains in two different ways by using what we call digital imaging correlation. Uh, I will get to that technology later and give more, you more details to explain what that is. And also by using strain gauges, and finally, we measured deflection uh, through the use of strength potentiometers and also by using motion tracking cameras. This is a very basic free body diagram of the powder blade test fixture. So as you can see, um, it's effectively a simple cantilever beam that is being tested through a point load at 5.5 meters from the roots. And the test fixture is designed to react and withstand the um, both the moments and the shear forces at the roots. And as the design loads um, were um, designed to be with a safety factor, we did not expect failure to occur in the blade throughout the test. Another, one of the interesting features of this test fixture that we designed is the rapid clamping and installation mechanism. So the way we did this is when the blade got delivered, you can see on the bottom right picture, uh, we, the first step was to attach the four sleeves, four quadrant sleeves of the uh, clamping system to the blade itself, uh, to the cylindrical part of the blade. This cylindrical part contained a lip, uh, so it was thicker and it stood out higher than the rest of the blade. This means that we were able to attach a, uh, what we call a front backing plate to the blade itself to ensure that, uh, or even reduce further the risk of the blade slipping within the frame. And so those parts stayed onto the blade for the entire test program. We never removed those. However, what we had is those sleeves were attached to what we call the rear backing plate, which itself was permanently attached to the test fixture. And it was attached to the sleeves through only eight bolts. What this means is we were able to uh, bolt the or clamp the blade plus the sleeves onto the test fixture rapidly by just using those eight bolts. When we were done with one of the test configurations, we were able to unbolt those, remove the blade, rotate it by any increments of 45 degrees, and then bolt it back into the test fixture. And this means that we were able in just five, 10 minutes to rotate the blade at any angle we desired. This is a picture of the load setup that we used for this um, test. As you can see, the loading was applied through a hydraulic actuator uh, that was itself attached to a pivot. And this allowed us to apply the load at any orientation, at plus or minus 10 degrees to the vertical. So when you combine the uh, orientation or the inclination that we could give to the hydraulic actuator to the 45 degree increments that we could clamp the blade at, 
we were able to test the uh, or apply loads at virtually any angle that we wanted. Uh, we also designed a, um, so in order to distribute the load through the entire blade profile, where we, we machine or um, a, an MDF tooling board in the shape of the blade profile at 5.5 meters from the roots. Um, we clamped the blade through this uh, steel system by using those steel bolts. And then the hydraulic actuator was attached to the top of this assembly and loading was applied upwards and in the upwards direction. This is an, a simple overview of the powder blade uh, instrumentation. So as you can see, um, this is the test fixture in yellow, the sleeves are shown in gray, and the front backing plate is the part that descends uh, over the lip on the um, cylindrical part of the blade. We had uh, what we call rosette strain gauges. I'll get into a little bit more details on that just a bit later. Uh, located at every one meter from the roots of the blade between one meter and five meters from the blade roots. Uh, we had a DIC, so digital imaging correlation uh, that was uh, done between two meters and four meters from the blade root to measure strain for a full 360 degrees around the blade. And this corresponds to our transition region, which is 2.5 to 3.5 meters from the roots. So this is the location of uh, the strain gauges that we placed around the blade. So rosette strain gauges in this case had uh, measured strain in the zero, 45 degree and 90 degree directions. And they were placed along four quadrant lines located around the blade. So as you can see the lines on the top left uh, of your picture. And along those lines, one strain gauge was played was placed every meter from one meter to five meters from the blade root. So that's a total of 20 strain gauges. Uh, this is a um, schematic or an FES or um, a 3D CAD of our test fixture, highlighting what we call the DIC area of interest. Um, so the way DIC works, for those of you who are not familiar with this system in the room, is you apply a, a pattern, a speckling pattern of, of black dots uh, to your blade. And you've got camera system, three sets of two cameras in this case that work like eyes and that are angled and that look above and on either side of the blade at the speckling pattern. And in real time, they're able to calculate the change in distance between dots. And when you calculate the, ch the, the relative change in distance between dots, you are able to get a 2D strain map all around the blade. So we first applied a white primer paint to this area of interest, and then used a silicon mask that, through which we had punched um, holes to spray paint black dot patterns all around this blade. It's actually a fairly time consuming process. This is the uh, schematic showing the position of our DIC digital imaging correlation camera pairs. Uh, and they were placed on either side of the blade and on the top. Uh, the processing of the DIC data was provided to us by Match ID. It's actually rather complicated to do this on your own. Um, so we're thankful to Match ID for providing us with this software. Over to Jeff now. Thank you, Christoph. Uh, yes, so as you can see, a lot of pre-design work defining the test program, working out which instrumentation and its location. And then here we have a slide uh, demonstrating what that instrumentation and its setup was. So in the in the middle, sorry, go back, Christoph. One. In the middle, you've got our um, breakout boxes, which is really important. We had 20 different rosettes, as Christoph said, with 60 strain gauges. It's really important to track those all the way through back to the National Instrument System. And you can see on the bottom left, Anastasia Savia, one of our undergraduate students, is actually soldering up one of the rosettes on the blade with the DIC system in the middle with two cameras like the eyes that Christoph described. So with all of this instrumentation on the next slide, we'll see that we have quite a few screens to monitor the test. The first four are talking about the strain, we're monitoring the load, the deflection, clear log and detailed strain. Then we've got the DIC and the triggering system followed by qualysis. 
And it was really important when we're doing this test in a lab, which was designed for um, more rigid structures that we're monitoring the system the entire way. So here you can see us with our test set up, um, everything designed, put together and assembled. They're doing their lowering the blade down into the frame and you can see the hydraulic ram attached on the right. The DIC system in itself has very difficult to, to reference to the blade. You've got all of these random space dots and you can see them on the top left. In the middle, there is the fiducial, the sort of bullseye shape right next to it to a rosette. That's very important because one of the things that we were doing was not only validating the response of the blade, but we wanted to validate and evaluate this match ID system. How well did it compare to strain gauges? So we had that fiducial there right next to the rosette so that we could uh, verify that the 3D map of strain around the entire blade section was, um, was as we expected. So the fiducials are used to orientate spatially the DIC with the strain gauge. Then one of the issues that we did learn with a flat surface like that is that the angle from the blades down until that flat surface became problematic. So we did learn a lot about setting up cameras for capturing an entire surface. We also used Qualysis to validate the slope and the deflection of the blade along its entire length using these infrared reflective markers. And this is a fantastic system if you're trying to calibrate uh, multi-bodies. Um, it's really used a lot in sports, but we use it in wave tanks here at the university. We also use it in this structural testing where you can put as many markers as you like and you can measure the blade without impacting it with say a potentiometer. It's great for fatigue testing because you don't have a, a spring and a wire going up and down millions of times. So here you can see with uh, one more click, you can get the markers on the saddle. We got an understanding of how the load application is twisting because as you load the blade, the, the actual ve force vector is shifting as the blade rotates. We were tracking that. And the next then gives you a video of this test. You can see the hydraulic ram closing as we load the blade up, showing tracking hydraulic ram. We've got um, the DIC in the middle. And then you can see the bright white lights that are illuminating the subject to detect it. So at this point in time, we're measuring strain, position, deflection, uh, which I would say are two different things. One is one is from a string potentiometer, one is from the actual um, Qualysis system. And then the next slide gives you a slightly different view where you have the synchronization between the strain gauges down on the floor with a click. Okay, so that's the DIC in the middle. And then you click again, you've got the strain gauges on the floor. Thank you, Christoph. And this entire system was synchronized with um, National Instruments hardware because it's not only important to link spatially where your measurements are taken, but also in time, because we were using quite an old hydraulic um, applicator. And this is my favorite view of the test, where you can really see the, the glass to the fiber transition, measuring the ply drops in the middle with strain and validating that with the, um, with the strain gauges. Sorry, measuring the entire wrap with DIC and validating that with the strain gauges. And you have the two eyes of the cameras looking at to recreate that shape. And Christoph will show you this later of how they validate it and an image of that 3D map. But it was great for us to take the DNV standard and try to implement that in a university lab, albeit only for one section. And next slide, Christoph. So these tests are sped up at about 20 times, we, we held it loaded for 60 seconds at peak, but we went up very slowly listening and making sure that there were no creaks. And we had accelerometers everywhere to detect any jolts. And the last one just gives you a demonstration of we were monitoring load. Um, it's a very open test. Uh, it does look a bit messy. Uh, this was a bespoke test program where we went in for two weeks and um, wired up the entire system, did the test and left and no one could see we're there. So it was quite a, a good little team effort, about 10 individuals, including undergraduates, PhD students and experimental officers made this possible. Thank you very much, Christoph. I'll let you go on to test results.
Thank you very much, Jeff. Um, so as I, um, as we were mentioning earlier, we ran this uh, test program as close as possible to the DNVGL test standard for the testing, the static testing of uh, wind turbine blades. And results from these tests include the uh, mass and center of gravity of the demonstrator, the strain measurements, the deflections, and the natural frequency, as well as um, basic checks to ensure that the glass to carbon transition region um, did not have any visible damage. Uh, you can see here um, as well on the right, uh, a nice uh, DIC 2D strain map of the area of interest. So, um, the way we measure the mass of the demonstrator as well as the center of gravity is by lifting the blade through a single point lifting point by using a gantry crane that we had available in the structures laboratory and lifting it through a load cell, as you can see on the right. The demonstrator or the blade was uh, weighed at 117.8 kilograms, so for a six meter long blade, so not, not that heavy. And the center of gravity was measured at 1,570 millimeters from the roots. Uh, the next step before we jump into any deflection measurements uh, was uh, the measurements of the frame angular stiffness. So even though we designed the test fixture to be as rigid as possible, uh, it isn't perfectly rigid and we're applying rather large bending moments to it up to 20 kilonewtons at 5.5 meters from the root. So that's around 110 kilonewton meters. And as you're applying moments like this, you uh, rotate, so you get angular deformation of the roots. And as the root has an angular deformation, there is displacement that you're measuring or blade deflection that you're measuring that isn't due to deformation of the blade itself, but rather deformation of the frame. So we needed to remove this unwanted measured deflection and the way we did this is we placed a laser near the roots of the blade on the test fixture. And we had it aimed at an A3 sheet of paper that was located at the point of load application. So 5.5 meters from the roots. And in doing so, we were able to measure the vertical deflection due to the um, blade or sorry, fixture rotation or angular deformation at 5.5 meters from the root at various different loads. And in doing so, we're able to work backwards using trigonometry and obtain a relationship for the frame rotation as a function of the root bending moments. And then when I did the data processing for the, for the uh, test program, I was able to remove as a function of the load, uh, the unwanted measured deflection from each of the load cases. The next step was the frequency and damping results. Uh, you can see on the bottom left uh, an accelerometer data of the X direction accelerate, uh, acceleration in Gs uh, over time of the blade during a um, free vibration test. The way we did those is you apply a big push on the blade and you let it freely vibrate. And the first thing that you can see is that there's a visible beating effect. And a beating effect occurs when you have two natural frequencies that are uh, relatively close to each other that are occurring at the same time. And we measured on the right, you have a frequency response, frequency domain response of the, um, of the fee vibration test. And you can see that there are indeed two peak um, frequencies uh, that correspond to the two different natural frequencies. Now, as you may or may not know, there's two main directions in a wind turbine blade, the edgewise and flapwise directions. And they don't have exactly the same stiffness. Normally, the flapwise direction has a higher stiffness because most of the loads are located in the flapwise direction. And a higher stiffness leads to a higher natural frequency. So it's not unexpected that we get those two different frequencies. Um, we measured no change in the natural frequency throughout the entire test program. And that's a good sign because, as I was mentioning, the natural frequency is a function of the stiffness and a function of the mass. Mass doesn't change, so any change in the stiffness during the test should have been perceived um, by a lowering of the natural frequency. 
So this is a, um, a picture of the strain results uh, for the load case one, which is the highest uh, load case up to 20 kilonewtons were applied at this point. And what you can see here is uh, the lines with the dots represents the four quadrant lines along which we had the strain gauges. Now we only have strain data for the five points here. So the linear interpolation that you see there is, so we don't know, this is just an estimation. We don't know that it's actual and linear interpolation. And this is where it's really nice to have the DIC data, because as you can see from the DIC data that we've added along two of the four quadrant lines, we don't actually have a linear variation of the strain in between the strain gauge positions. And this is because we have a very complicated layup. We have ply drops going on. And this actually leads to a nonlinear uh, strain values in between the strain gauges. This cannot be captured through the use of strain gauges. And this actual, this uh, uneven variation or distribution of strain between strain gauges was also predicted by Suzlon when they did their uh, structural modeling. And so we're quite happy to show that we were able to recapture this in the testing phase. And it, hi it highlights it that all this time spent calibrating uh, the digital imaging correlation system was actually uh, worth it. And in fact, you would say that the two uh, methods of strain measurements actually complement each other quite nicely. Now, uh, we also, uh, when we ran the repeat run of load case four, we obtained all, um, all these strain values obtained were within 0.005% of the ones obtained in the first test run, which suggests that no permanent strain was uh, obtained in the blade during the entire test program, which is a good sign because if any permanent or plasticity or permanent damage had occurred, you would expect to perhaps measure some permanent strain in there. Finally, we measured uh, deflection. As I was mentioning earlier, uh, the deflection at 5.5 meters from the blade root is shown in the table below. And as you can see, the um, the maximum measured deflection was at 240.9 millimeters. So now this is at 5.5 meters, which is not quite the blade tip. But even when you do the interpolation to measure the, the blade deflection at the tip, you're still well below the maximum 400 millimeters that were defined by Suzlon in order to avoid hitting the blade structure. And what we can, uh, what we notice as well is we obtain a similar um, maximum deflection in the repeat run of load case four compared to the initial run of load case four. So once again, this suggests that there is no increased compliance in the blade or no reduction in the blade stiffness that was measured throughout the test program. In conclusion, because of all this uh, data that we captured, we're able to show that no damage detrimental to the blade structure occurred during testing. Once again, we cannot guarantee that absolutely no damage occurred in the form of very minor, uh, for example, delaminations or other small um, minor damages that could have occurred during the blade testing. However, we were able to ensure that the blade behaved structurally exactly the same at the end of the test program compared to the beginning of the test program, which is a good sign that you know, it didn't take damage detrimental to the structural properties. Uh, we were able to ensure that the maximum deflection was well below the maximum allowed uh, 0.4 meters. So that criteria was passed. And that means that we were able to successfully uh, validate the demonstrator design, uh, which is good because it contained, uh, we had never built a blade before with powder epoxy resin. And we had never, we combined this with this uh, novel carbon fiber to glass fiber spark cap and all of this passed and met the design loads. Uh, we we're also able to, me to measure the strain deflection natural frequencies for all of the load cases, which we passed on to Suzlon. And hopefully this will allow them to uh, validate their uh, structural modeling and help them uh, have better knowledge when it comes to design of future structures with uh, these type of design. Uh, all in all, the lessons learned from this project uh, will increase the speed at which powder epoxy technology 
and hybrid carbon glass fiber technology can enter the market of large wind turbine blades. So now I will pass over back on to Jeff, who will speak about Fastblade. Thank you, Christoph. That's very good. So this is a real eye opener for us. There's, a, there's actually an error on that slide, Christoph, this one here. It should be 20 kilonewtons on the six meter wind blade. The red frame, you can see that we've just shown you videos of in testing. And whilst we were carrying out this test, the university was developing Fastblade, the blue frame at the back, which is a lot bigger, going to one mega newton, equivalent of eight buses compared to one car. So we'll take you through some of that development and come back and answer any questions at the end on the, uh, the testing or fast blade. So the next slide is just one. We've got to thank all our partners that have made fast blade possible, especially Babcock, who provided the site and the engineering design for the large reaction frame. So, so what is fast blade? We've been talking about wind testing, but now we're talking about tidal blade testing. And that is the next one with the, the big green frame. You can see here in real time a fatigue test of a tidal blade. That's what we want fast blade to be. What you saw previously was a static test, very slowly loading a, a wind blade. And in, in wind fatigue tests covered underneath the 376, the DV, DNV standard, the fatigue tests are done through oscillation. We can't do that with a tidal blade because it's too stiff. So what we've had to do for the next slide is to develop these blades, which are 13 meters long, We'll be loading it with hydraulic cylinders and we can place them anywhere on the loading area and we need a really strong box beam reaction frame to react that and a plate which can adapt to any blade to mount them so behind the underneath the deck is the 800 liter per minute regenerative pumping and i'll explain to you how all of these things interlink to deliver the next part which is um, a facility capable of next slide crystal yeah six 15 mega newton meters in static that is huge. That is eight, sorry, 24 double decker London buses held at five meters or 15 feet away from you. And that three mega newtons of static load will be used to fatigue these large tidal blades up to about 16 meters in length. And that facility has taken the university, the EPSRC, 4.1 million pounds in capex and will be ready by the end of this year. And the reason that we're doing this is because we're 75% efficient. Current technology will be extremely expensive to put these amount of loads into structures with these deflections. We go back to physics, uh, energy is force times distance. We've got big forces and long distances, and that's a lot of energy. When we can capture the energy with this technology, not from the ocean, this is during testing. So, so we'll keep, that's it, good slide, Christoph. So, so why do we need this? If you look at the swept area, all right, of a wind blade, it is four times bigger than a tidal blade. However, the thrust acting on a small tidal blade, one quarter of the size, is four times that of a wind blade. So we have these tiny short blades that are exerting, that have to react four times as much force. And that's why they are short, they are stiff, composite sections in the hundreds of millimeters thick at the root, and a very, very short transition from the circular root section into the aerofoil shape. So winches would be expensive, hydraulics, conventional hydraulics would be expensive, and oscillation is not possible. We'll go to the next one to explain that. As we get shorter, stiffer tidal blades, we have a longer um, length than the picture you can see shaking back and forth at its natural frequency. That just simply wouldn't be possible because the the thick sections in a tidal blade would heat up under this frequency of loading at their natural frequency. All right, so the next one would show how we can use this regenerative hydraulics with the pump on the bottom left, where we are pushing energy into the blade, which is then deflecting the blade where it's stored as potential energy, and then it's passed back into the hydraulic pumps as kinetic energy. So we can't use resonant testing, but we can develop our own resonant system by coupling it to a store of kinetic energy in a hydraulic pump. So in the top right, you can see this big black mass being lifted, looking like a large JCB, the yellow utility structure. What's happening here is they're picking up this mass with hydraulic energy, lowering it back down and capturing that energy. And the same thing will be applied to a blade and fast blade. So moving on, now that we've got this basic design, 
Fastblade is going to be located in Edinburgh, just above the university in, sorry, not in Edinburgh, but in Fife, just above the University of Edinburgh, where we developed this um, facility on a dockyard site with access with land and road and rail. Um, and we'll be able to bring in these tidal blades and test them. And we're very grateful for Babcock for the facilities engineering that they've shown. And we'll just click through the next few pictures here. You can see we started off with a fairly large hole and we kept digging that hole out until we poured down a solid concrete floor, built up some walls and made a space for our large pit. Sorry, that's a can't control dogs. <laughs> Go back a second, Christoph. Okay, so this is the facility as it stands right now. That picture was taken on the time-lapse camera today. We're currently waiting for the large reaction frame. If you click next, does that fade work? No, the fade is just going to white. That's okay. We'll jump over one picture, Christoph. Okay. Okay, so this is taken from above, looking down onto a yellow blade attached to the strong green frame at the back. And this facility will be available for testing large composite structures, anything that fits between 16 meters long, three meters wide and three meters high. And one of the interesting points is how do you take all of the load exerted these double decker buses and apply it into the structure. So go back one slide Christoph. Here you can see a saddle clamped just like we had in powder blade, but rather than 20 kilonewtons we're putting in mega newtons. And that stress and that load introduction point needs to be carefully monitored and, and made sure that we don't cause premature failure of the blade. So one of our projects with our MSc student Miguel on the next slide demonstrates how they've modeled that layup, adapted the saddle design to reduce stress concentrations and assure that the failure we'll see during a test is due to fatigue at the root and it's unaffected by load introduction. The next slide shows the control system. Hopefully we managed to have fewer screens than we had in the powder blade test, but we'll be able to monitor that system for three months as it exerts up to 20 years of service life on a blade. Um, with 75% efficiency. And the system can test other structures and it's designed to help people come with novel ideas, novel composites, different materials applied at large scale, so higher up in the pyramid and give us a way of testing these devices like in the next slide, such as this mast raising equipment made from glass fiber. Um, we, can, we can take these structures and put them through their paces in an energy efficient manner. So th thank you very much for listening trying to keep us on time. And I think we'll hand back over to Scott to moderate questions. Thank you, Christoph. You're welcome. Okay, first of all, I, before I get to the questions, I would uh, like to to Eddie because I forgot to uh, give his bio. So let me just uh, give a couple of words on uh, Dr. Eddie McCarthy. Uh, first of all, he's got a PhD in polymerization and uh, polymer characterization, which is very important to understanding how all these materials behave. Uh, he's got uh, uh, been in charge of numerous projects at the uh, University of Edinburgh with novel materials, uh, certainly lean materials. You just got through hearing about the uh, epoxy composites with, uh, with uh, powder embedment. Uh, he's been working both offshore and tidal wave projects, uh, one of which was called Tideflex, and that's trying to minimize the, uh, the operational energy loss that, uh, that one gets. So with that, uh, I'm going to go to some of the questions now, but I, I apologize to, uh, to Eddie for, for forgetting to do that at the start. Uh, we had a number of questions, uh, one of which, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it up to uh, who wants to respond was uh, the CTE and stiffness differences where you have the carbon and the glass uh, uh, concentration areas, the, the transition areas. Was there any FEA done and uh, was there a concern with uh, say CTE or, or stiffness differences between the two materials? Um, I can take that one if you want. Um, so we weren't directly involved with the uh, manufacturing phase of this uh, carbon to glass transition. But from what I know, 
Um, the manufacturers had experience with manufacturing, um, so air composite experience with manufacturing carbon to glass composites. And I am not aware, or at least I've not seen myself any FEA done uh, on this particular problem during the design phase. Uh, so I guess they must have used their, their, their manufacturing experience. Hey, Scott, okay. we have a, a couple questions live, too, that I know right, Jeff I, and Eddie have targeted. Yep, I see them on I'm on, I'm then, I'm then, I'm then right now, sorry. Uh, one is for uh, uh, Clement uh, uh is fast plate recovery energy in the form of electricity from a generator on the exhaust pump's crankshaft, or is there another scheme? So, so I need to re very, redo that, let me know. No, that's good. That's a very good question. And what it is, is the pump has a spinning inertia, kinetic energy. And if you look at it, it's analogous to a bicycle going up a hill and down a hill. And so the pump is spinning with a lot of kinetic energy. You then torque the pump to apply the pressure to send the, the fluid through the hydraulics, which then pushes against a large spring, which is the blade. And that then the pumps are actually loosely tuned. What that means is we're not trying to make them hold a certain speed. We actually let the pumps slow down and they reduce in kinetic energy stored in the pump and the blade then holds the potential energy as it's deflected. At which point you've got the full load exerted on the blade. It's, um, you know, the spring of the blade is compressed effectively holding potential energy and the pumps are spinning slowly. Then what you do is you let the pumps, they can switch from pump mode into motor mode. That is the unique USP. And the, the blade then is allowed to push the oil in reverse back through the hydraulic system. And the pumps then allow that flow to speed the pump back up. So technically they're pump motors. Now that pump motor is novel. It's unique to um, the digital, digital displacement technology developed by Artemis Intelligent Power, now actually Danfoss. And that then pump would speed up for the next half of the cycle back up to near its original RPM. And that 75% efficiency is just used to top up the energy losses in the system. So if you look at the bicycle going up the hill, the bicycle starts at the top of the hill, uh, sorry, starts moving, goes up the hill, slows down. That's when the blade has the energy and the bicycle is going slow. And then it goes down the hill and the blade puts the energy back into the pump, spinning them up faster. And actually when we witnessed this laboratory test of the green thing in the top, they were recovering 90% of the energy on each stroke, uh, which is insane. And it's truly phenomenal. And it, it's only done through these digital displacement valves that are controlled electronically. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, there's another question uh, from Greg Lambert. How was the powder blade manufactured? Okay, so I'm happy to take this question, Scott. Um, so uh, to Greg, I would say um, the, the process essentially involves obtaining um, a pre-impregnated uh, fabric. So the, the powder preg is produced separately to the, um, it, it's a, a, an, an initial process that doesn't necessarily take place at the OEM. So the powder blade is supplied as is, sorry, the powder preg is laid into, um, in this, on this occasion, it was um, a polymer composite tool, but it could be ceramic tooling um, if necessary, if the, temp the temperature of the cure is sufficiently high and it was cured over a, a total cycle time of the order of six hours. And the significance of this is that a typical uh, wet resin infusion type process could take up to 24 hours, um, depending on the length of the blade. So the uh, cycle time for these uh, powder impregnated um, manufacturing cycles is much lower. Um, it should also be mentioned that the, the melting temperature range and the curing temperature range for the powder epoxy materials are separate, they're quite separate. So melting can take place at the order of 80 degrees C, whereas the curing uh, only begins at about 150 C, 160 C upwards. And the advantage of this is that you can um, melt your epoxy into the fabric, cool again, um, 
assemble your material and then remelt and cure at a higher temperature when you're ready. And obviously with the liquid system, uh, you don't always have this opportunity because you need to infuse. And then once you raise the temperature to a certain level, um, you're locked into a permanent cure. Um, so there, there are some of the advantages that you encounter with uh, the use of the powder epoxy material. So I hope that answers your question in the essential um, points. Um, and obviously I'm happy to take more detailed questions if, if, if necessary. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, another question, just uh, uh, we've been talking about uh, wind turbine blades as well as tidal wave uh, blades. What is the, the difference in fatigue history? When I was, what do you have designed to that may be different? What kind of fatigue history for wind turbine blades above land and, and uh, tidal blades below land? Is there any particular guidance of where you have to go? So I'll, I'll take that answer or that question. There is, there's a lot of similarities in the process and the, the wind energy has developed methods of taking that load history and convert it into a, a handful of fatigue tests. But tidal really has to suffer something which the wind doesn't, which are the waves. And currently tidal has only been deployed in sites which aren't wavy. But as we move out into wavier sites, then you'll have the typical uh, flow, tower shadow, uh, turbulence, all of these low different characteristics end up adding to the fatigue life. But if you can imagine every 10 seconds from a, a ocean swell, which could speed up your flow by a factor of two and almost stop it in storm conditions, that tidal turbine will be undergoing 5 million wave cycles a year potentially, depending on where it is. Now, Currently, that is limiting the factors for design of blades. Part of the reason we need to test them so we can move these tidal turbines out into more energetic sites to capture more energy. And I'll be honest, the IAC, we haven't really got methods in place for capturing these because A, it's very difficult to install them in these areas and B, it's very difficult to measure these environmental conditions. But that's that's what we're doing here in Scotland. They recently left the orbital marine power two megawatt device on its moorings installed for the next year or so. I don't know how long the pro program is, but uh, fatigue for tidal blades will be an issue, especially with waves, and we will solve it with places like fast blade and novel materials like this. To that to that same extent on the question. Uh, it looked like uh, your fatigue test went out to maybe 7 million cycles. Um, what would you do normally? Would you normally uh, stop that pretty much at 7 million? I mean, going much further, it takes a long time just for another order of magnitude. Do you do much in the way of coupon testing? And if so, how do you extrapolate that to longer cycles? So I'll, I'll leave Eddie to go into the coupon testing. I'll stick with the big blades for a moment. But um, in terms of the, the first answer on the question for the 7 million cycles, it come down to uh, what that test program was. So if they want to test a failure, then we would do that. Um, but the DNV standards typically will have a static test, then a fatigue test, and then repeat a static to see if there's any change in stiffness. So you would do a prescribed number of cycles rather than test a failure. But ultimately it'll come down to cost and what that certification method is. Right. Um, so with respect to the issue of coupon testing, so usually coupon testing is, as most people know, is the, the first step on the, the testing pyramid, where we do a basic sweep of materials across the market, assess them on the base of, basis of their static performance or the static uh, loading performance um, and their toughness, et cetera. I personally think having done quite a lot of fatigue testing on coupon over the years is that it is not particularly relevant or transferable at the larger scale. And one of the reasons simply would be the, the, um, the loading, the boundary conditions. So the loading conditions of a coupon. So that they're not really reflective of what you might expect to see in terms of crack initiation and propagation at the larger scale. Um, at, at best that there are comparative benchmarks with which to compare materials. But obviously the holy grail is to establish a hierarchical model that could potentially 
extend results at coupon level to that at large structural level. Um, how quickly we're going to reach that type of model, I'm not sure. However, I think facilities like FastPaid can accelerate the, the pace at which we can reach the development of such a model if we use intelligent um, digital twins of, of uh, material performance against uh, full structural, structural testing. So hopefully that answers that. Yes. To some extent. Um, you also have big differences because you have both carbon and glass in there. And uh, yep. carbon uh, behaves differently by itself. Uh, glass behaves uh, a little bit uh, less functional. And uh, they both seem to not necessarily have a fatigue endurance limit. So it's, it's hard to say unless you really go out farther. Is that the case, Eddie? I would say so. Yeah, I, I think we, we do need to test at significant scale and over significant periods to, to be able to um, state anything with confidence in terms of fatigue. It has come to our attention recently with some studies uh, uh, that NIAR, the National Institute of Aviation Research uh, in Wichita, that there are some techniques for extrapolating that, but then you've got to extrapolate that and apply it to a structure that you can't test any further than uh, maybe maybe a million, uh, 10 million cycles at best in a reasonable uh, uh, time period. Yes, and, and I should add that the, the heating effects or the frictional heating effects generated during fatigue, the, they, they would be completely different at the two scales as well. Right. And that would need to be adequately accounted for. I've seen some work uh, recently where uh, uh, it has been suggested to use viscoelasticity and type of time temperature shifting to maybe test at uh, in higher temperature, but with uh, lower frequencies and then shift that. They haven't seen anything actually in that. Are you aware of anything, Ted, Eddie, or anybody else? Uh, personally, I haven't seen um, reference to an extension of time temperature superposition to fatigue testing in that sense. I've seen it used in other contexts. I, I would have to reserve judgment without, you know, without further, without further study of it. But potentially, there, 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 there are, um, there is potential for that type of, of approach. Okay. Uh, one final question. We're getting down the end. Uh, was asked, what kind of fiber volume fractions can you get with powder uh, epoxy system? Where, um, where are you working now, and what do you see to be a typical range of utility? So um, from, from what we've worked in uh, research projects in our lab, um, we can go with quite good confidence and with quite good fiber impregnation up to about 60% fiber volume fraction. We have done coupons at 65% fiber volume fraction, but uh, when you get to these kind of high, high uh, levels of fiber volume fraction, it's difficult to ensure that every single fiber is properly wetted and there's no fiber to fiber contact directly. Um, I mean, for my PhD, most of my samples and the structures I work with are at 50% and there's no issue with 50% at all. You could even go higher if you wanted. Okay. So I'd like to, at this point, I'd like to thank uh, Eddie and Jeff and Christoph and also Brianna for uh, running this. I think it's been a great session. Um, certainly if uh, the attendees that are on this uh, have additional questions, uh, you can uh, send those in to us and we will pass those on. Uh, and Brianna, I'll open up to see if you have any additional comments on uh, the availability and other things. Sure, yeah. Thank you, Eddie, Christoph, and Jeff. This is awesome. Um, we will be sending all the registrants a copy of the session recording from today's webinar and also a copy of the slides there. So mm -hmm. expect that in your inbox in the next couple of days or so, and we'll go from there. But Thanks again to, to our speakers today. Today was an excellent presentation on our recent journal issue. Um, and we'll go from there. So thank you guys. Thank, thank you. you, Scott, for moderating. Well, thank you for, for everything that has been done. And it was a great uh, presentation. I really appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Brianna. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks.